All right. You're in the clear, kid. Okay. <laughs> All right, page 81. We're moving from, we're moving from the, the realm of, uh, you know, of course, the overall theme is why do people not see the Bible alive? And we've talked about the matter of ignorance. We've talked about the matter of deception. And then how in the third, uh, the third step in that progression, that ignorance with deception uh, leads to conceit, or leads to uh, being conceited in one's deception. And that many people are unwilling to even, to even give a serious consideration uh, to the fact that they may be wrong on, uh, wrong on a certain matter. And we've discussed uh, in, in brief and in, in, in part about the need, uh, the need for uh, uh, civil discourse and to, and to have the ability to sit down and discuss matters as opposed to you know, the present uh, polarization of our society. And by the way, um, you know, as you know, I've got, of course you know that I'm, everybody knows I've got a Facebook page and, you know, I post my Bible reading blog and other things on there, but uh, you know, I follow a lot of people. I think I'm approaching 37 or 3,800 people in my, my friends list, and this polarization uh, is, is in the church. I mean, you know, the things that happen to us as a society will end up being in us as a church, and the church is polarized. And there is, uh, you know, there is a, a group that, for the most part, has left us um, on the, as uh, on the on the left side, uh, loosing where God has bound. And uh, those folks are not nearly as influential as they were, say, in the '80s and '90s when this movement uh, got started. Um, uh, Woodson made the statement. I heard him make the statement back in the '90s, and uh, and it. Is wrong true, but not because he's any kind of prophet, but because he understood the history of our people, and that uh, that there have always been problems that have arisen in the church, and that those problems will manifest themselves, and then those then those who are minded to adhere to that type of thinking eventually kind of coalesce and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and congeal together, and then. Everybody knows who they are, and then they're only influential in their little, you know, in their little group, and then the rest of the church moves on. And it's been that way. It's it's been that way since the mid 1800s. With you know, for example, the the, the instrumental music issue, the uh, the uh, uh, missionary society issue, the anti cooperation, anti orphans homes, you know, uh, issue, uh, the Holy Spirit issue in the 60s. Um, and then various other issues that, that have arisen, for example, the change, the change <coughs> movement of the 80s and 90s. And now, you know, now those people have fairly coalesced, and we, everybody knows who they are. And there are, there are lines of distinction. On the other hand, there are people polarized in what we, we would refer to as mainstream, the mainstream brotherhood. And that, and that there is a tremendous lack of civil discourse in in our brotherhood, and it, it manifests itself in social media. Uh, you know, you know. For example, I'll just give you an example. This happened today, today, that I just put out kind of a, a general request because on our Sunday night series we're going to start studying various errors that are associated with the Lord's Supper. You know, we've been talking about different religious errors. And so I said, I've got a list in my mind of errors, you know, doctrines of men that are associated with the Lord's Supper. And I said, now here they are. And I listed about five things, I think. First of all, I listed the error of uh, the frequency of observance. Either that people observe it, you know, less than once every first day, of, you know, less than on the first day of every week, or more than once a week, okay? And so that was one. And then for, and the, and the obvious one is the doctrine of transubstantiation. You know that, uh, and it's a, generally it's a Catholic teaching, but it's also associated with other, uh, other what we call high church groups, uh, 
You know, I, I know the Church of England and others teach it that when you take the Lord's Supper, the elements become the literal flesh and blood of Jesus. That, you know, and I see some of you looking at me strange, but there are more than a billion people on this planet that believe when they eat the bread in the Lord's Supper, it turns into the literal flesh of Jesus Christ. And when they take the juice, it becomes the literal blood of Jesus Christ. And that doctrine is called transubstantiation. And so, and so there are a lot of people that believe that. There are people that believe that forgiveness of sins is received uh, in the Lord's Supper. Uh, and I can't remember what else. I don't, I don't remember what else I, I threw out there. But within an hour, I have like 27, you know, and I ask specifically, what other doctrines are there associated with the Lord's Supper that, that I have overlooked? I, all I'm looking for is suggestions of things I've overlooked. You know what I end up with? A bunch of people yag yag back and forth about whether or not you can offer Lord's Supper on Sunday night. I mean, I had had that post up for 10 minutes. And, and somebody's posting on whether or not you can offer the Lord's Supper on Saturday night, and then somebody's got to answer him, and so then it starts a big back and forth. There's no telling how many posts are on my page right now. I haven't looked in the last 45 minutes, but there's no telling how many posts there are about some of that stuff. And and, and by the way, one brother that, that commented on it is a good friend of mine and was extremely civil, all right? But he still missed the whole point. <laughs> He still missed the whole point of the thread. The, the point of the thread was not for him to, to argue the matter on my Facebook page. The point of the matter is tell me something that, that brethren or others associate with the Lord's Supper that is not right. But then you get all of this back and forth. And just people, like I said, this friend of mine and, and was very kind. But this, this whole idea that we get, we're going to argue about, you know, that, that, wasn't even, that wasn't even the point. And by the way, it gets a whole lot worse than that. I mean, it gets a lot worse than that in, in, on a lot of different things. And so, but the biggest problem is nobody accepts the idea that they can possibly be wrong. But the only way you're going to figure out, if, you know, if, if, if one is right and one is wrong is to have civil discourse. And by the way, civil discourse is no guarantee that you're going to come to an agreement. But it's the only way you'll ever come to an agreement. Some of them want you what? Fermented wine. Wine instead of just. That's on the list. That's on the list. Somebody added that to, to the list. But but you know, if you if you don't have if you don't have civil discourse, you're never going to come to an agreement. But civil discourse is no guarantee. I'll give you an example. Bill Maher had Ben Shapiro on his HBO uh, uh, show this week. You'll not find two more polar opposites. In the political in the political realm, than Bill Maher and Ben Shapiro, and you know what? Those guys talked for an hour and didn't manage to call up each other names. You know, didn't have to shout each other down, didn't have to interrupt each other. And I mean, from the very outset, and the whole point of the program was to show that two people who are radically opposed to one another's views in the, in the political arena can at least sit down and have a civil discourse. Which they did. Guess whose mind got changed? Nobody's. Nobody's. But that wasn't necessarily the point. The point was we were going to show that it can be done. And so this idea of, of deceit leading to conceit because of one's ignorance leads a person to believe, to, to never consider the idea that they could possibly be wrong. That leads us to 81. Human conceit and human action. And I'll tell you what, I learned a lot. I learned a lot in this, in this lesson. I learned a lot in this lesson. Yet, yeah, because Struth understands the human psyche. I mean, he's the man. Not only was the man a great Bible student, he was a he was a tremendous uh, he was a tremendous psychologist, understanding uh, the, the the human mind. And so on page 81, he talks about, really he's kind of going back and laying the groundwork of all the things that have been uh, discussed previously. But he says, it is fine, at the bottom of the first paragraph, it is fine to have a zeal for God, 
But it is pitiable for one to have zeal without knowledge. This led many of the Jews to destruction. You know where he got that? You know where he got that phrase? <laughs> Romans chapter 10. <laughs> Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, which is, but it is not according to knowledge. And they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and having gone, gone about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for all of those who believe. And so Paul readily admitted that the Jews were zealous for God. They have a zeal for God. But their zeal wasn't based in knowledge. It wasn't based in truth. You know, uh, uh, for example, uh, even in the latter times of, of our, in, in the, toward the mid to the end of the Luke's account in Acts, when Paul, you know, when Paul went in to the temple at James' request, and by the way, I believe Paul sinned when he did what he did. Because Paul went into the temple and gave the impression that he was still a law keeper. His, the impression, that the express statement that James gave to Paul was, let them know that you keep the law perfectly. Paul wasn't a law keeper. Not as far as the, Moses, as the law of Moses was concerned. But Paul went into that uh, went into that system, or into that situation because James was talking about that there were still a bunch of Christians who were still zealous for the law of Moses. Right? They, they had a zeal for God. But they had a zeal for God but they didn't have a, a, the sufficient knowledge to, 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 to show them that you can't have competing covenants. And so their conceit, the idea that, that, that they, first of all, they were ignorant, therefore they were deceived, and then they ended up in a situation of conceit, led to all kinds of problems for Paul and, and, and those. And, and really, that's kind of the beginning. Understand the terminology I'm using. That's kind of the beginning of the end for Paul in the book of Acts. And what I mean by that is, you know, from Acts 9 to Acts 20, <laughs> You have you know, Paul moving here and there, going, preaching, establishing churches, etc. Not that he did it without persecution or, or, or you know, severe trouble, but from that time forward, that was when his arrest took place. And from that chapter right there to the end of the book of Acts, Paul was a prisoner of the state. What, what, was, what, what was the entire thing? What, what predicated... Or what uh, 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 preceded the entire situation? Human conceit. Ignorance, deception, and human conceit. And so uh, it, was, it was a zeal for God. But it was not according to knowledge. Then he, then he, uh, he kind of backtracks here to bottom 81. That deceit is a universal human weakness. That not only flourishes where ignorance is but serves to increase our ignorance as well as become the agent through which ignorance blinds us and holds us to our old errors. And in the bottom he says most people develop their religious views at a time when they are not old enough, mature enough, knowledgeable enough to weigh what they are taught accurately against what the Bible teaches. And again, that's true for all of us. It's not just true for people in denominationalism. It's true for those of us in the church. That we accept as true. We accept as true what our parents teach us. As well we should. But at some point, as I said last week, my parents' faith has to be converted into my faith. Which means that regardless of what my parents say or do, I still have to hold on to the Word of God. And you know, and, and so, and, and, and so, but most people are not willing to turn their back on the religion of their youth because the religion of their youth is the religion of their family, their parents, and their grandparents. All right. So now, 
We'll look down at the bottom of page 82. 82. After making a discussion about uh, the, the false security of uh, self-satisfaction, Paul made this statement from 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. He says, I know nothing against myself, yet am I not hereby justified. In other words, Paul says, I don't know anything wherein anybody can make an accusation against me so far as God is concerned. He says, but my knowledge of such or lack thereof is not the standard. In other words, I'm not justified in the idea that just because I don't know anybody that can accuse me or because I've never been accused it, or things like that. In other words, that's not the standard of whether or not I stand right before God. Think about it. Almost every single religious individual can say the same thing, right? No matter what religious error they may be entrapped in, would not almost every one of them say, I'm not, I'm not accused. I don't know anything whereby anybody can accuse me. But the problem is, rather than saying, as Paul said, this is not the justification of the fact that I'm right, they say, this is proof of the fact that I'm right. I'm right because nobody's ever told me I'm wrong. Nobody's ever shown me that I'm wrong. So, so all of us, again, even in the church, look, there are look. There are a multiplicity, I would say even the majority of people in the church that know what's right. They know what's right. And they do what's right. But they can't tell you why they do it. That's the way I was raised. That's what I've always done. I was raised in the church and I was taught to do this and I continue, I continue to do this. You know, folks, that's not good enough. And that, that, that's going to be part of the discussion, if the Lord wills, here in a few minutes when we have our worship assembly uh, about the matter of, uh, of my sermon, about growing in the Word of God with a view to discipleship. Look, it's not discipleship to do what you've always done because that's what you've always been taught and you believe in your heart that that's right. You know, we've, got to be able to, you know, we've got to be able to give an answer for why we do what we do. And because I was taught it, it's not good enough. You know, because this is the way I've always done it. It's not good enough. And so I think a lot of that plays into the fact that people lack the ability to have civil discourse because nobody really knows why they believe what they believe. They just believe it. And you can't have a discourse about matters when, when both people's fallback position is, well, that's just the way I was raised. what my parents taught me. You can't get anywhere with that. All right? And then right beneath that text on page 82, not he who commands himself is approved, but the one whom the Lord commands. And then he says at the end, uh, talking about that thorn in the flesh from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, he says, I'll glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. I take pleasure in weaknesses, injuries, necessities, persecutions, distresses. And I think this is an important statement. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. In other words, the cause of these, the cause of these things in which I take pleasure have to be for Christ's sake. Now, all the persecution that you read about in the New Testament is all for Christ's sake. It's all because people left Judaism and embraced Christianity or they left idolatry or, or Roman paganism and embraced Christianity. You know, the Bible never speaks to Christians about just having to endure persecution for persecution's sake. You know, to, to, to accept wrongdoing just for wrongdoing's sake. Or just just for the sake because because I'm a Christian I have to I have to put up with every single thing that somebody wants to do to me. The Bible doesn't teach that. The persecutions that are associated with Christians is because they are Christians. 
You know, if, it, if it was the case that all of us had to just endure persecutions for any sake, then if somebody comes in here armed to the gills or four or five guys walk in the back door armed to the teeth, then we just got to stand here and let them shoot us like fish in a barrel. Right? We all know we all know better than that, don't we? I hope we do. You know, if I see somebody physically assaulting my wife, I'm just I'm just going to stand by. I'm just going to stand by and, and and just let him warp her upside the head because I'm a Christian and I can't. I'm not supposed to resist persecution. No. Oh. Paul said these are things that I endure for Christ's sake because I am a Christian. That. Let's flip the switch on that. If somebody comes in and they're going to kill me because I'm a Christian, that changes the whole dynamic, doesn't it? It changes the whole dynamic. But just because, but I don't have to sit around and put up with evil just because of some, you know, some drug crazy knucklehead, you know, is looking to rob me so he can, you know, buy his next, you know, hit of dope. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to tolerate that. You know, I, I don't have to just give him my money or. Or let him, you know, rob my house or, or hurt my family for those reasons, right? But if, if somebody's persecuting me because I am a Christian, that's a different matter altogether. It's a different matter altogether. And some of you may have, you know, I've endured some of that, you know, not to not to any degree to what Paul endured it, you know. But I've been, you know, I've had some difficult situations because I'm a member of the church. Because of what I preach. Right? And in those cases, you just got to take it. You just accept it, you know, and you move on. But you know, I don't have I don't have to tolerate foolishness just because just because the world's full of wickedness. That doesn't work that way. And so, you know, Paul says, I rejoice in these for Christ's sake. But then look at the end of this paragraph here on top of page 83. The converse is also true. Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. As long as I'm weak because of Christ. Stroop says, the converse is also true. When we are self-sufficient, independent, confident of our ability, satisfied with our knowledge, and content with our accomplishments, when we are strong in our own sight, then we're weak. Paul says, when I'm weak, I'm strong. But the converse is true. When I think I'm strong, then I'm weak. Because my confidence is in the wrong source. Now, if my confidence is in me, it's in the wrong source. It's got to be. It's got to be in uh, in Christ. Uh, I thought about. I was thinking about uh, Romans chapter two and verse seventeen, beginning. Indeed, you know, by the way, Paul had just. I mean, he had just blasted the Gentiles in Romans chapter one. I mean, man, he he ate them up. But then he turns around in chapter 2, and then he starts in on the Jews. And he says in verse 17, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident. There you go. Get that. Confident. That you are a guide to the blind. Or, or, or that you're confident, yeah, a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. And then, bam, here it comes. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? And then he goes on to list, in a general way, the very things that the Jews were condemning in one form, they were practicing in another. For example, not particularly in this text, but the Jews condemned idolatry, right? I mean, any, any good, faithful Jew would condemn idolatry, right? But if we went back in the Old Testament, you remember when they trotted out the Ark of the Covenant because they thought the Philistines were better, were more powerful than them? So we're going to, you know, we're going to trot the Covenant out. We're going to trot, I mean, I mean the Ark of the Covenant. 
Was that not a form of idolatry? They put their faith in the, in the Ark of the Covenant to deliver them. That's idolatry. New Testament. Jesus says, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, says, if a man swears by the altar, he's not obligated to keep his obligation. But if he swears by the gold that's on the altar, he's obligated to, to keep it. He says, you foolish, blind people, what is greater, the gold or the altar or temple that sanctifies the gold? Well, so what was he talking about? That's idolatry. <clears throat> we think that the temple does something to this, and therefore we'll, we'll forget the temple, but we'll make, we'll make this the, we'll make this the binding factor as opposed to the God that's behind it. That's idolatry. And so, you who, you who condemn idolatry, do you not commit sacrilege? Or oh, you think that you're strong, you think you're knowledgeable, but do you not practice the very thing that you condemn in others? And, and, and he listed in a general, in a general way, you know, some of those, you know, some of those things that they did. Now, question. Can I be guilty of that? Can I be guilty of that? Can you be guilty of that? Can we condemn some things in others that we ourselves might be guilty of practicing in a different form? No, it's all the same, but one takes one form and one takes another form. But they're both essentially the same thing. Like a, it'd be like you know, you know, you know, a person, you know, a person can do, you know, you know, he's a dope head. You know, he smokes weed. Right? But I drink socially. I, I condemn the guy, I condemn the guy who smokes marijuana recreationally, but I'm a social drinker. Now, the only difference in those two things is in Alabama, one's legal and one is not. But in Colorado, that wouldn't be the case. They'd both be legal. You see how some people hope that other folks' sins is... By the way, this, the reason I mention this is because Kevin Treasure and Ron and I, we've been visiting all weekend. There's a congregation in Memphis whose eldership, after prayerful study and consideration, has determined that there is nothing wrong with social drinking. And put it on their website. And when they have church gatherings, they drink. Now, you know, who are, are they going to condemn, you know, are they going to condemn the dope smokers? Yeah, I mean, if I if, if I show up at a church function, you get to drink your beer, but I get to smoke my weed. If not, why not? You know? And so, you know, condemning things in others that we ourselves might permit. By the way, we might condemn some things in others that maybe we don't practice ourselves, but we don't condemn those things. In other words, I might not be a social drinker, but if I condemn this person for smoking marijuana, but I don't condemn this person for being a social drinker. I'm in contradiction with my position, am I not? And so we have to be careful about, by the way, I'm not saying we can't condemn wrong. I mean, obviously the Bible tells us that we can and we should. My point is, is that we have to be careful that when we when we condemn or when we point out that, that there, there are problems with this or that, we have to make sure that we ourselves are not guilty of the same form or the same thing in a different form. All right? And so that's page, uh, page 83. Now, here's, man, have we had a bell yet? No? All right. Let's go to page 84. And we're not going to get to that. There we go. I'll get. I'll, I'll introduce this. 
in a general way, and I'm going to stop, okay, because I don't want to get too far into it. Strength, I learned something. I saw something in the book today that I had never, ever considered. And, you know, we always talk about reading things in context and, and, and you know, to get a right understanding of what, of what something is about, you need to read it in its context overall. Well, I got hit right upside the head in my preparations for lesson today. In Matthew 16, oh, of course, in Matthew 16, uh, was it uh, 24? Uh, if any man will come after me, if any man will come after me, let him do what? Three things. Deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. All right? Now, what we'll do with, Lord willing, next Sunday is we'll look at some of what it means to what it means to deny self. Because truth, first of all, corrects the error that sometimes we think about denying self in the sense of denying things to self. You know, for example, uh, you know, he denied himself a college education so that he could stay home and work on the farm to help his family. You know, you know we, we, we would use that term, he denied himself this thing so that something else. And that's a, that is a misunderstanding of, what, of the text. You know, the denial of self is not the denial of things to self, it is the denial of self. Of self. All right, and so we'll spend some time with that. But here's the one that got me. Every sermon I've ever heard and every sermon I've ever preached and every lesson I've ever taught on self-denial from this text has failed to take the entire context into consideration. Matthew 16, 24 begins to, if a man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That statement was not made in a vacuum. That statement is not some kind of standalone statement that is to be ripped from the immediately preceding context. What do we find in the immediate context of Matthew 16, 24? Well, we can go all the way back to verse 13, right? Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say that are you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets, John the Baptist. Who do you say that I am? Peter. No, no, Peter. Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Job. <coughs> Blessed and blood is not the good of this team, but my Father who is in heaven. I say to you, you're Peter, upon this rock I build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail, or Hades shall not prevail against you. All right? Then verse 21. Then Jesus began to teach them how that he was going to be delivered up to the Jews. You know, and, and, and just to, to summarize it, he was going to be delivered up, he was going to be wrongfully treated, crucified, and raised the third day. All right? Now, who spoke up against that? Peter did. When Jesus said, I'm going to go up and be crucified, the same feller that just said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. By, by the way, if he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, then he's got all authority, right? I mean, just by making that statement, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, a person is saying, he has all authority. So now, the one who you've just said it, has all authority, has said something else, and you contradict him. I'm going to be delivered up to the Jews and crucified and raised the third day. Peter says, far be it for this to happen to you, Lord. This will never happen to you. And Jesus says what? Get behind me, Satan. You're a rock of stumbling, a stone of offense. You do not care for the things of God, but for the things of men. And then he says, verse 24, If a man will come after me, let him deny himself, 
take up his cross and follow me. Who do you think he was talking to when he said that? Had to be Peter. Had to be Peter. And in the literally in the hundreds of times that I've read Matthew 16, I've never preached verses 24 to 27 in context with verses 16 to 23. And Stroop points that out right here on pages 84, 85, and 86. And that is so important to a proper understanding of what it really means to deny self. Alright? We've had two bells, right? We'll stop right there, little Will. Pick up there next week.